the pleasure of inviting uh, three panelists to the podium. Uh, we have Dr. Alan de Lima Pereira, uh, if you can join us. We have Dr. Surendra Wong um, and uh, Dr. Philip Matthew. Yes, okay. Um, thank you for joining us, Dr. Matthew. So uh, just a brief introduction, Alan is uh, a doctor from Goa and has worked with MSF uh, in several missions. He's seen firsthand uh, the consequences of antimicrobial resistance in many, many countries. Uh, we have Dr. Surendra Wong, who's an epidemiologist from France, uh, also an old MSFer, uh, and now uh, with uh, WHO, uh, in the South Asia office here in Delhi. And we have Dr. Philip Matthew, who is um, the director of REACT. Uh, Representative yeah. Um, who uh, is, a, is an organization that works on uh, AMR. So, um, Alan, if I, if I may, I'll start with you. Perhaps you can paint a picture. Uh, you've seen the two presentations. Uh, perhaps you can paint a picture of what you're seeing on the ground as far as, uh, you know, the, your ability as a doctor to effectively treat patients, uh, uh, you know, of, from infections. Um. Thanks, Suni. Um, yeah, I think the first two presentations were a really good example of what we see as MSF in the field. And I think me and a lot of people who worked with MSF can say um, it's quite common in most of the countries we work. Uh, we've been using quite broad spectrum antibiotics and for common, common syndromes um, and not uh, tailor-made for certain, uh, like we said, uh, based on resistance patterns or local sensitivity patterns. Um, this has helped us, like we said, improve the quality of care and respond fast in the places we've been working. But now we've been seeing uh, resistance developing and we have, in addition to the examples that they already gave, uh, surgical projects in Jordan treating uh, osteomyelitis, which are resistant to most antibiotics. Um, so we have experienced, I think there's been some studies in Afghanistan as well, which show huge, huge numbers of antibiotics used. So we definitely see that as a problem. Uh, I think one of the things we've really had, had difficulty in scaling up or ha have difficulty is in access to bacteriology labs. Uh, this is still not standard practice in most of the places we work, and the turnaround time to get a sensitivity result to tailor make your antibiotic per patient is still uh, too long in most places where people don't have, and people and healthcare providers don't have access to this. Um, the next challenge we see, or a need we really see, is a point of care tests. And um, it's very difficult clinically sometimes to say, is it bacterial, is it viral, should I prescribe or not? And more often than not, as we've seen, we err on the side of caution, uh, not knowing when we may see this patient again to prescribe antibiotics when in many cases it may not be required. Um, and I think uh, we've also not been able to, so whatever sensitivity patterns are being done in many places, we've not, we've not been able to um, collate the data across the MSF movement or across different hospitals, not just MSF in the places we work to provide this evidence back to the treating clinicians to help, to help them decide on treatment. And again, this, with antibiotic stewardship coming up, there's still not enough clinical microbiologists, trained infectious disease specialists in MSF and outside in most of the countries we work who can help with the stewardship or mentorship in this direction. Mm -hmm. Just a question of clarification. Philip, do we have a database now in MSF where we collect information from all of the uh, different projects uh, like we have for TB, like we have for sleeping sickness. Is that the case? We don't. So we still have much more work to be done. All right. So um, I'll move on to Surendra. So six years ago at the World Health Assembly, this was a big topic of discussion, uh, antimicrobial resistance. What has changed in, in terms of awareness, in terms of action at the global level in the last six years? Good question. I'll try to be very short, but um, let's start with the positive side. I mean, I, I do believe that for the past three years we have seen a tremendous uh, momentum about raising awareness on, on antimicrobial resistance. And you've seen that 
from the uh, two years ago in 2015, and I consider it as a milestone where you had is that from the World Health Assembly at WHO, a resolution that uh, push for first a resolution about the adoption of the Global Action Plan, which is a milestone, and secondly, uh, recommending actually uh, strong recommendations for country to develop their own national action plan. Uh, it's kind of uh, easy to say, but very difficult to do, and uh, the condition about the action, action plan was to make it align with the global action for the, well, it's not only a paper where you could have empty uh, actions without interconnection between the different sectors, but this, are, this is my, so I can expand on the, the detail. And recently, um, in last year, in September, this is the first, actually not the fourth time, that we have a health issue that was brought up at the UN uh, General Assembly, and it was about recognizing the problem of antimicrobial resistance as something that is a global threat for health security. And this, uh, for security itself of, uh, of mankind, but health security as well. And that was a tremendous advance. If you want to com compare it, this was the fourth time that there was issue was brought at that level. The first time was HIV, Ebola, and non-communicable diseases. So AMR is at this stage now, where it's uh, uh, leaders of the world know of the threat posed by uh, antimicrobial resistance, more importantly, antibiotic resistance. So you talked about the, uh, the global, first of all, there's Correct. a global will now, but also a clear will to align national programming with international priorities as well. Perhaps, Philip, uh, you can uh, tell us what's been happening in India. I know that uh, the government has formulated a, a national action plan. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about what that action plan entails and perhaps the breadth of that plan. Um, the, the reach outside just the Ministry of Health and all of the other actors involved. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. I am uh, Dr. Philip Matthew. I'm not the director of REACT. Uh, I'm representing the head of REACT Asia Pacific. But you're the director for us today. Thank you. <laughs> we give you the title. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, India has formulated a national action plan on antimicrobial resistance uh, in line with the global action plan uh, very recently. Uh, uh, the best part about it is uh, there is no finger pointing. Usually in all discussions about antimicrobial resistance, it's all about, uh, uh, you know, you caused it and you are responsible for it and all that. But uh, I believe, you know, the, na the National Action Plan India is a more progressive document. There is no finger pointing. What, uh, why make, there are some references about who is responsible and all that. But, uh, but it's mostly a moving forward document, uh, a document about uh, how to move forward and what other things to be done in short term, medium term, and long term. Okay. Uh, um, another important uh, uh, thing, you know, another important fact about uh, uh, work till date before the National Action Plan was formulated was uh, all the departments or government institutions are working in all the organizations, so even the civil, civil society organizations, departments, institutions were all working in silos. Uh, totally disconnected to each other, totally compartmentalized, but probably uh, with the coming of National Action Plan, there will be more integration in activities, as in uh, multiple ministries can come together and uh, formulate uh, 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 a kind of, you know, implementation plans together. Uh, uh, um, other things is like, uh, 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 apart from the National Action Plan, I, I believe uh, 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 there has been a lot, lot of overemphasis on the medical healthcare sector till date. But the National Action Plan has realized that you know probably we should be we should be looking at uh, the non-medical uh, aspect of antibiotic use also because you know as Sir was saying uh, almost 70 percentage of the total antibiotic production is consumed in. Um, in, in sectors like uh, uh, fisheries and animal husbandry, uh, basically as uh, growth promoters, not as curative components, as growth promoters. So it's high time we should be looking at that. So uh, there is a lot of emphasis given for the farm sector, uh, uh, where antibiotics are being used as growth promoters. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the need for integration between government departments. Uh, civil society organizations can do uh, up to a certain limit. We realize that uh, if, if you want to take forward the message, we have to engage all the government departments. All the government ministries, all the government departments concerned, all the government institutions and the key administrators have to be on board if we want to take this message forward. I'll give you a, a small example how uh, uh, antibiotic resistance, the, the, we have been discussing antibiotic resistance for a very long time in the academic circles, but it hasn't reached the actual people who are working on the ground. Uh, recently we had a workshop, we 
we had a workshop, uh, we found out that uh, the Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies, uh, it's a state university for fisheries only, a specialized university for fisheries, has published uh, around 15 articles in reputed international journals on antimicrobial resistance, but uh, the administrative people who came for our workshop, uh, mostly people above the rank of assistant directors, deputy or joint directors from the uh, uh, Department of Fisheries, had very rudimentary knowledge about had uh, a very rudimentary knowledge about uh, antimicrobial resistance in spite of the fact that the state fisheries university was able to publish 15 uh, articles in reputed international journal. That shows the disconnect between academia and uh, 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 the actual policy makers slash administrators. So possibly the national action plan is a comprehensive, uh, can give us a comprehensive platform by which you know, we can take forward our, our initiatives in the field of antimicrobial resistance. So we've talked about uh, practice, we've talked a little bit about global will, we've talked a little bit about policy. So what we'll do is we'll take a few questions, but when I come back, I would like each of you to maybe provide three priorities going forward in uh, research, uh, in practice, in research and in policy, all right? So um, questions, uh, okay, there's one, the first. Please state your name and uh, where you're from. Hello. Yeah. Great. Good morning, everybody. I have been working as a junior resident. Your name and My name is Dr. Dhyan, and I have been working as a junior resident at Paras Hospital, Gurgaon. Uh, the topic here is antimicrobial resistance. I'm sorry, I came late. Uh, important issue was raised about the use of antibiotic in the viral fever. But I come from North India, an important issue was left, that use of antibiotic without any prescription. Yeah. If you go anywhere, I come from the small village of Varanasi, when I go to my village, there is a menace of antibiotic use. Everybody using amoxicillin, everybody using Ciplox. So, do we have awareness program number one? And number two, we need a strong legal action against those who are giving antibiotics, especially important ones, without any prescription. Thank is you. MSF is doing any work for legal action okay. in India? Thank you. And we have uh, we raised that point in the last presentation, but we'll Thank come you. to the legal uh, part of it. There's another uh, speaker there, and then Lena. Uh, thank you very much. I am Dr. Vikas Agrawal. I am uh, Regional Director for Kala Azar program and also Regional Coordinator for Fleming Fund, which is looking after AMR related issues in South Asia. So um, my kind of comment to all the three panelists, one is that, you know, in fact, I was uh, having a question which you asked that whether MSF is maintaining the data set. And I think it would be very critical to have data from the MSF site and not only from the MSF site, but all the sites which nationally have action plan is working on. But the real challenge would be to have sufficient microbiologist and data surveillance point in these centers and have the capacities. So um, with regard to the uh, kind of focus, the question which you had, uh, there is a emphasis Fleming Fund which would be supporting 30 countries on AMR through Department of Health UK. So the emphasis would be to strengthen the surveillance point and AMR resistance data collection and analysis and reporting into WHO net. So that's the kind of yeah. comment. Thank you. Um, so far, there have been no questions uh, for the panelists. I would like you to reformulate your comments as questions. But uh, Lena, perhaps you have a question on the legality, uh, legal aspects uh, that the first speaker asked. I uh, want to ask a question on the process, yeah. um, on the AMR policy. And maybe, you know, I, I shouldn't be asking you, but I should be asking the government. Did they hold any regional? or state-wide uh, consultations on before formulating the policy because the WHO has sort of given a blueprint of it but it does need uh, it does need to be tweaked and there are going to be very specific issues that are very contextual to particular areas particular countries did the government do any of that so yeah. that would be a very useful input into the future of working with the government yeah. and uh, on the legality we can deal with yeah, it we'll come back to it so, uh, Dr. Matthew and maybe uh, Dr. Wong can also comment on it. Yeah. 
uh, for the national action plan for for india like there was no regional consultations as such as in uh, uh, a decentralized consultation process was not followed as far as i i know but uh, but there has been a reasonable amount of consultation which happened based in delhi okay uh, with uh, multiple organizations center for science and environment was involved multiple organizations civil society organizations uh, react was also a part of it so uh, there was a fair amount of consultation which happened in delhi but uh, regional consultations probably you know we need to work out more on that uh, uh. Thank you. I, I, I want to thank you for this question. I think it's a key question for, uh, for me. Uh, it's, there's a lot of confusion on the fact that when you look at best practices in terms of policy, when you look at overarching policies, for example, uh, preventing uh, the sale of antibiotics without prescription, for example, or the growth promoters. And I'm not pointing out at India, but it's a regional uh, picture of the region, is that you may have policies, the overarching policies, but getting to the level of enforcing those policies is the major issue, with a lot of problems with governance and, and uh, things like this. But the real issue is about making sure that the government is taking charge of developing country-specific policies to make sure that this overarching policy would work. And I just want to uh, highlight this, this challenge that's uh, needs to be really uh, taken care of by, by government. And this is one of the things that we, we thought about, aligning the national action plan with the global action plan. is really about making sure that you have uh, all aspects of the global action plan in the national action plan. And you know, with this approach that it covers all sectors, including policies, the regulations, for example, not only having the Ministry of Health handling the, the, the uh, the national action plan, but having all other sectors like the agriculture part as well, but in, being inclusive of the civil society and of course NGOs and the private sectors and the, the manufacturing industry. So this is the, the, the comprehensive uh, thing that we would like to promote. And within that comprehensive approach, this is one of the conditions of the alignment is to make sure that you have a monitoring evaluation system embedded in the national action plan. And we see it as key to make sure that this national action plan is not about a document that you put on the shelves and you forget about this. It's making sure that countries are now accountable because what I say in the national action plan is also about showing the gaps, but making sure also that we can measure progress. Yeah. But uh, Surendra, maybe I'll take the prerogative to ask a question. The, how does the national action plan, for example, very specifically address the issue of the way research and development is done, where, you know, the, how intellectual property and how uh, the way innovation is structured today, uh, how is the government trying to address that in, you know, India is known as the pharmacy of the, of the developing world. How are we changing the discussion around drug production uh, and uh, research and development? Mm. This is a question for India specifically. Yeah. Okay, I wouldn't go too much in detail, but uh, let me uh, get into the bigger picture of the, uh, the, the research aspect of development. And you want to, oh, you want to take the no, question? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I do believe that, uh, oh, I do believe that, okay, I'll be very short. I do believe that the approach for development and research in India was the fact that you have very extremely uh, good uh, institution that are doing research. But if you look at the bigger picture, they're all scattered working in their uh, own ways. And if you compare with countries that have the potential also to do an uh, innovative approach in terms of uh, new antibiotics or new diagnostics, for example, uh, or other intervention, is the potential for the government to maybe coming up with an approach where you will have a capacity for those institutions to work together with the same, and you know, uh, I'm not saying a naive way, but more a consortium approach with these common objectives. So I try to be short in that and stop yeah. here. So we'll take one more question and then we have to go round up uh, the person here. Thank you. I'm Dr. P.K. Bansal from Merit. Uh, it's my personal experience comment. Even in the remote areas, say CSC, BSCs, and small villages, we should not start the day one antibiotic empirically until unless the patient is critically ill or deteriorating very fast. And if it is so, the patient should be transported to the nearest multi-specialty hospital, having a facility for the 
culture and sensitivity and depending on the protocol of that particular hospital, sure. the available data regarding the microbes available, most susceptible an antibiotic should be given. That is the, I think, best way. And probably most, we should avoid a polypharmacy or polyantibiotic therapy. Yes. So, I mean, it's clear that the, the issue cannot be addressed with you know, that we need a multi-sectoral approach. We need to approach it from the ground up all the way to the level of policy. So what I'll do is I want to come back to each of you and perhaps you can give two or three priorities in the, for example, Alan, in, as a physician, what are the two or three things that need to happen uh, to change the game? Yeah. I think I just want to start by saying why we want to rationalize antibiotic usage, the thing as MSF and as all of us we want to keep in mind is we don't want to give up access to people who need it to save their lives. So it's a bit of a give and take while ensuring people don't lose their lives because of lack of antibiotics. We need to make sure people have access to antibiotics and we rationalize use. As clinicians or as people who work uh, with patients, I think uh, a couple of priorities. One is definitely a scaling up of uh, stewardship programs with bacteriological lab sensitivity. Like he was saying, I don't see the point of referring to hospitals, but m maybe uh, make lab sensitivity data more available even at a peripheral level uh, in the future, um, in the ideal world. Infection prevention and control is something we've not spoken much about and hospital acquired infections because that's where a lot of the resistant ones spread and something where we can improve. And uh, the third thing I, I think we need as clinicians is more operational research on point of care tests and things, aids that can help us at the bedside of a patient to make the decision safely and effectively. All right, so hygiene, Diagnostics and the first and, one. Uh, stewardship, stewardship. bacteriology. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Surendra, in terms of three sort of priorities, in terms of the <coughs> research. Uh, oh, research. Yeah. Okay, let's, yeah, I'll, I'll put it that way as well. I mean, the major, of course, the research is to have better diagnostics, better new antibiotics, but this is easy to say, but the challenge is huge yeah. and I want to expand. But I wanted to raise the issue of uh, having data. And so far, AMR is a complex issue with a combination of different conditions, different antibiotics, uh, I mean, you know, even antibiotics, but also antifungal agents or antiparasitic agents, plus uh, the n numbers of antibiotics, which makes it very difficult for us to uh, produce data. And, and of course, these days I really need it for awareness and to have a, a better understanding from not only the population, but also the higher level on the, the, the what's at stake for, for it. And so far, we don't have any information on the trends. We have a data from grassroots. We have some national data that shows the trend, most importantly from developed countries, but nothing from our region. And this is one of the major objectives that we need to achieve. Yeah. Have there not been some attempts at global registries to plot uh, resistance patterns, etc. What, what, what success have they met with? These well, sort of it's work in progress. I mean, there are. If you, ref I want you to refer to this, this global survey that was done in 2015, and uh, also the uh, global surveillance uh, report in 2014. I think uh, it really shows the gaps. It's just that we have a number of threat that goes from ESBL to gabapentin resistance or MRSA, uh, vancomycin resistance. Uh, but if you look at the pictures in countries, most of those information is, is missing. And, and this is, needs to be uh, taken care of. And what I'm saying missing, it's not only missing in the human health sector, but it's also in the animal sector. And looking at surveillance for consumption, but not only consumption in the human sector, yeah. but also in the animal sector. And the, the, the potential for uh, those uh, antibiotics uh, resistance spread uh, that spread through environmental contaminations. These, we need data. We don't know the magnitude of the problem yet. So, I mean, given what you said, it's heartening to see that India does have a national action plan. It has 12 ministries coming together to address this. What, according to you, are, um, you know, some of the uh, things that the action plan should sort of recognize and emphasize and prioritize for the coming years? 
our national action plan incidentally is a much larger document as compared to the global action plan so uh, at least the document size wise you know we are better than the global action plan uh, but uh, uh, seriously speaking and uh, an intersectoral coordination which has to i mean like, uh, on the ground there has to be an intersectoral coordination uh, and uh, all the stakeholders has to be uh, brought on board actually uh, uh, we have been focusing on ministry of health for a very long time multiple countries have been focusing only on their ministries of health by other departments, especially at least uh, the people dealing with animal husbandry, fisheries and agriculture and also environment needs to come together uh, for a reasonable uh, uh, outcome. Okay. Uh, otherwise, probably it may not be possible to obtain a reasonable outcome. Uh, second is collaboration between civil society organizations. You know, a lot of organizations have been working very uh, discreetly, probably if, the, if we can come together, synergize our efforts, uh, uh, we can make uh, uh, a better output can be possible. Uh, and uh, of course, genuine concerns of uh, people engaged, like you know, um, uh, you, uh, my co panelists were saying about uh, point of care diagnostics. Uh, in our uh, informal discussions with health administrators, uh, at least the southern part of India, we found out that access to point of care diagnostics, like you know, uh, uh, pediatric centers being equipped with uh, simple things like blood counts or uh, access to a CRP, uh, improved antibiotic prescriptions, you know, uh, actually rationalized antibiotic prescriptions by a way. Uh, by a huge extent. Also, we need substitutes. You know, people are using um, antibiotics and growth promoters in the farm sector. We need some substitutes because you know uh, their yield is at stake. They won't be backing off without if, if they don't have a, a proper substitute. So these are things that uh, uh, we should be taking care of, of course. And uh, research should be focusing on. There should be some research which should probably focus on. Uh, things like faster turnaround time for intensives because empirical therapy is uh, wrecking havoc at least in the hospital sector. So uh, things like that yeah. uh, has to be, I, I believe you know, we are running out of time, so yeah. stop. So I'm being hounded off the stage, but I want to thank the panelists. I know this, we haven't had enough time to discuss all of the aspects of uh, uh, you know, uh, public response to AMR, but thank you so much for joining us. And I'll hand it over to Philip. Yeah.